I'd sat down this afternoon, what was said? Well, very little information has come out about that. A television reporter can perfectly well just present a report of the thing. And having a person in the studio in London swinging round in a chair and cross-examining the reporter is A, a waste of time, and B, distracting. Thank you, Penny. ITN maintains that we're supposed to find all this warm and friendly. The cold truth is that it is a blatant branding exercise, a substitute for news. Part of the obsession with going live, even when a story is half dead, or when there's no story at all. Julia, it's one of the ironies of reshuffle days that you never actually see very much of the person, the Prime Minister, who causes all the upheaval. Well, tonight, in fact, John Major is in Downing Street, and no doubt he's confident that he's done something which will lift the fortunes of the Tory party. Which is... TV news reminds me of one of those model railway clubs where overgrown schoolboys get to shunt around the hardware and pull all the levers. They do allow girls into play occasionally. But that doesn't mean they're safe to be allowed in the signal box. No, sir. Behind the scenes, I think it has to be said, there are no senior editorial figures at ITN that I can think of. And I know I'm probably laying myself open to somebody jumping out and saying, what about me? None that I can think of who are female. And I think that does have an effect. A line I used to hear a lot in uh, programme conference, editorial conferences, in the day leading up to the programme was, oh no, that's a minority issue. I've heard that line applied to stories about cervical cancer, for example. Um, and I used to sit there and I used to think, but who decided that sport had to be included in news bulletins? I think it's very depressing that we don't have a senior woman newscaster who leads off the news. And there was a survey recently that, that said that most male and female viewers didn't have very much confidence in female newsreaders and it's not remotely surprising they're always given the junior jobs if one thinks of channel four news john john snow um starts with a 10 minute leader into the news about what's going on and then zina badawi if she's lucky gets to follow up with the less interesting stories now the news of some of the day's other main developments here's zainab badawi Talks are still going on tonight. The woman here is literally a bit on the side. Smiling, supportive. She looks like the perfect trophy wife. She's there to flatter the graying gent at her side, to add a little light touch to his weight of experience. That's it from Moira and from me. Good evening. Understandably, TV news has always been fond of powerful images, but of late it seems to have embarked on a diabolical affair with them. If the camera wasn't there to film it, it didn't happen. Reporters increasingly find themselves writing stories to go with the pictures rather than the other way round. Drama rather than news is the order of the day. So if you can have dramatic pictures, it doesn't really matter whether A, whether the story is important or not, or B, whether you bother to explain the story or not. The pictures are the message. The obsession with pictures is almost laughable. But it becomes downright pernicious as news pokes further and further into what the trade likes to call human interest, or inhumane interest, as I prefer to call it. It took 40 years to get cameras into the House of Commons, a place of public declaration. But news crews find no difficulty in entering a church for a funeral and staring rudely into the mourners' faces. A final journey for James Bulger. His infant coffin surrounded by flowers in his memory. Every element of the funeral mass had been selected by his parents, Ralph and Denise. The cameras admitted with their permission. The night of James Bulger's funeral, the 9 o'clock news and news at 10 made the service their lead item. Hello, the teddy bears he loved so much sat side by side in church today, the day of the funeral of James Bulger. The toys were propped up on a seat that had been specially made for James by his father. It was placed a few inches from James's coffin. The cameras focused on James's teddies on the altar. James's favourite Michael Jackson song was on the tannoy. These talismans of affection meant a lot to the family, but once they became common currency, they felt cheap. This wasn't news. Parents crying because their child is dead isn't news. This was the yoking of the mawkish and the macabre that television has learnt so eagerly from the tabloid press. Ten years ago, five years ago, such prurience would have been unimaginable. In TV News' coverage of the Third World, we see the dead baby syndrome writ large. Mass destruction makes good box office. Its complex aftermath, less so. When the US troops left Mogadishu earlier this year, so did the cameras. 
I think that from the point of view of people like me who've spent our lives in the third world and in countries like India, one of the things which we find hardest to take is that our parts of the world only get on the air uh, when there are disasters or famine or something like that, political assassination or something like that. And we're squeezed out most of the time because the agenda is very narrow. If one looks at the coverage of South Africa during elections, that, that seems to me a classic example of a foreign story that, that has been utterly lost. You, the, the foreign teams educated us, they took us up to a very interesting point in the South African story. For two months we were led to believe that this was the most important story happening in the world. South Africans of all races have turned out in their millions on the first full day of their election. Nelson Mandela cast his vote for freedom, but Q... We began to recognize the players. We developed a level of knowledge about it. And then what happens? When was the last time you saw a news story about South Africa? With both the BBC and ITN under pressure to make savings, experienced foreign correspondents, the guys whose faces looked like relief maps of the countries they covered, are disappearing. We still have journalists of the caliber of Martin Bell and John Simpson, but the system that grew them is dying. As the authority of the coverage diminishes, so the urgency and pomposity with which it's presented increases. Dr. Hook and the others working here have that privilege, unique to doctors in these situations, of saving lives every hour they're able to go on working. The story of one doctor's courage. And News at 10 on Monday will be extended to have another special report from Julian Mannion in Goma. What happens when you don't put things into context is very simple. You end up just with the concentration on uh, people who are dying or on houses which have been knocked over in a cyclone, people who are starving, whatever it may be. And there is no explanation of why they are dying, how the war broke out, what might be done to prevent uh, such disaster being caused by cyclones in the future, and all those very important questions. A mass graveyard the size of a football pitch is full. Now bodies may have to be burned. You may find scenes in his report distressing. In other words, roll up, roll up, something to appall the whole family. The coverage of the Rwandan crisis was more concerned with pictures than with context. Another refugee, clasping an empty cup in one hand, loses his struggle to survive. Other people's tragedies are shamelessly rigged and presented as stirring mini-dramas for our catharsis. One man, Irishman Kevin Noon, is fighting alone a heartbreaking battle to dispose of the diseased corpses. Come on! Would you get to work? There are, on the bus, there are people dead. Would you get them off it? Some of those declared dead, he found still alive. Hurry this man! Walk to the hospital, he's not dead. Yes. Hurry! This remarkable man fought back his tears and returned to work. The news prefers to filter suffering through pictures of aid workers or troops. Pictures that add little to our understanding but give us a feeling that we are doing something. It's quite shocking, uh, quite horrifying and there's a real job for us to do out here. One of the problems with the way that we cover Africa is that we all, always cover it through our own interests. So, for example, we hear from... Uh, Western aid experts in Africa, we very rarely hear from Africans themselves. So it's not surprising that our perception of Africans are people who are inarticulate, who can't speak for themselves, who are used to having white voices explain their story. And it's, it's little, little surprise that we have such a distorted view of the continent. Back at home, investigation also seems to be less of a priority than window dressing.